Pitt Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of semiconductor engineering. I'm here with Rowan Yanka from Fraunhofer IIS EAS. We're going to talk today about new issues in power semiconductors. Rowan, things seem to be getting a lot more challenging as we move into more advanced nodes, as we start packing more uh, devices onto a chip when it comes to power. What are you seeing are the big problems? Yeah, right. There are a number of uh, new issues coming up when you want to integrate power devices into your silicon package. And uh, the most important thing of power electronics is, of course, temperature. You have to take into account the additional power dissipation. This is handled by a number of ways, like thermal vias you have to integrate. You have to think about new design aspects, design rules. Um, where you take into account thermal gradients on chip, or um, you um, take into account the ISO lines on, in the layout. But sometimes it's not only uh, static temperature, sometimes it's also uh, thermal cycling that you have to take into account. So uh, there are a number of aspects really connected to temperature. And um, you have to see what, what are the design rules you have to follow. Uh, other design aspects are you have to look for your on-chip power delivery network or different power domains. This is if you have different power domains, then you have to deliver the different power sources to the things wherever they are. And yeah, yeah, you have more networks in your chip and, and this is uh, leads to additional effort. And one of the big problems here is that a lot of these chips that are being developed where you're really seeing these problems are customized too, right? So there's no, you you haven't done this some of this stuff before. It's a brand new uh, domain-specific design. Sure, there, there are power devices out there in, in the market for sure. But what you want to do today is bring it onto smaller spaces, integrate more uh, functionality into smaller space. So... Uh, you really would like to integrate the power devices together with the surrounding electronics into uh, one of the same chip. That's why uh, they're, they're coming closer together. The, the power devices dissipating power devices and maybe sensitive devices from the input stages, which are very uh, close nearby. We're also starting to get some new materials coming in here too, right? So we've got silicon carbide, we've got GAN, and we've got GAN on silicon. So people are starting to put things together in ways that they didn't in the past. What sort of issues does that raise? Uh, yeah, there are a number of new materials coming up because they're more efficient to uh, in, in, in power uh, electronics, like, uh, as you said, like uh, silicon carbide, gallium nitride. And they're devices out there, but um, they're typically discrete devices. Um, what you want to do now is integrate those power devices together with driver electronics uh, on the same chip. And that's why you need to design additional devices in the same technology if you want to put it into a monolithic um, IC, or you put different devices uh, side by side into a system and package, which is also possible. Both aspects have their uh, advantages and disadvantages. There's not a whole lot of data available for a lot of this stuff too, right? Because you think about some of these these techniques, while we've been experiment, experimenting with them for quite a while, there really is no field testing of these devices. We're now throwing them into the field and saying, oh, these have to last for, what, 10 years sometimes, 15 years? How do we know that these things are going to age the way we expect, that they're going to uh, draw power in the way that, that we expect? That's an important aspect. I mean, the for uh, classical technologies, CMOS technologies, degradation effects are very well understood, and there are degradation models out there. For the new technologies, this is uh, not yet completely understood, and the, there are no completely understood degradation models out there. So what uh, you need to do is to understand first the uh, new degradation effects. There are new de degradation effects on these new technologies. You need to characterize them for those devices, for the technologies. You need to set up respective models um, representing this degradation behavior. 
then you're um, able to integrate those degradation models into the design environments and give the designer the ability to see upfront what happens with your device after say 10 or 15 years of operation which is uh, absolutely important say for your automotive uh, qualification of those technologies how accurate are those models because as we move forward we're starting to hear more and more about workload dependent type of computing where it may affect things differently depending upon what your workload is how you use it uh, where they what the domain that's being used in uh actually looks like you think about a car for example uh if it's driven in one place it may be very different than how somebody else drives it in a different location with completely different ambient temperature of course they're uh, different uh, mission profile, as we call it, if you are designing this this chip, chip the devices, the technology, we have to uh, make assumptions on the usage profiles later on. Yeah, they may differ, they may vary. So that's why the idea is in the future to have different usage profiles, and then uh, the user can choose from a variety of different usage profiles and choose that one that is most aggressive or uh, a mixture of those. So there are different ideas to take them into account, but first you have to understand what are the typical usage profiles and how to incorporate them into your design process. One of the ways that we used to deal with this in the past is we used to add guard banding into these designs. You had the, enough space where you could say, oh, we could devote this much circuitry. We're not as worried about the power. The, the parameters that you're working with right now are much tighter than they were in the past. How does that affect what, what you're modeling and how does it affect the reliability of these devices going forward? Yeah, uh, this is absolutely true. In the, in the past, there were a uh, guard band to the real limits, but nowadays you keep getting closer to the physical limits and you need to understand really um, what are the usage profiles and how long are you in which say, safe operating areas. There are um, different areas with different degradation um, effects. And you have to take a typical mixture of those different areas and um, be more precise with your modeling and with your simulation. You do not, the rule of thumb is no longer uh, possible. You really have to simulate those effects and, uh, and, and how they affect your design. We used to run according to what was was considered the 80-20 rule, where 80% of the people was enough to justify how you did a design. Is that still the case? Or are we now running 90-10 or 95-5? I mean, how is this starting to shift? As you said, there are different um, application areas. If you want to go for automotive or maybe industrial or aerospace, then um, you really um, have qualification processes where you have to go through and these have to be followed. And that's why 100% uh, of your design have to uh, follow the rules. If you're in consumer electronics, sure, then there are more relaxed rules. You can go with 80% uh, with, with your design and 20%, maybe you cannot, or they're beyond uh, your, your user's profile. And another way to frame this is we used to think about reliability in terms of this thing will not break over at any point in time, whereas now there's been a suggestion that maybe we should move to more resilient computing, certainly in the automotive space with ADAS, where if something fails, there is a way out of that and it still continues to function. Is that starting to happen in more places than just automotive? There are a number of application areas where um, safety critical electronic plays a role. So this is uh, besides uh, automotive, there is industrial electronics, there is medical, there is uh, aerospace. You have to exactly look into this application, have to understand the, the usage, usage profiles, the um, application boundary conditions, so to say, and, and see what does it mean for your safety um, to make sure that the error rate is far below that what the safety requirements are. Looking at all the things we've just talked about, are the tools that exist today, are they 
uh, granular enough to be able to make all these changes? And are people using them in a way that do they have enough time to use them? Are they fast enough to be able to say, okay, we can address all these issues pretty effectively? From my understanding, the tools are there. So there are um, tools out there to really take that effects into account. Maybe there's more work needed to really take thermal effects into account during your design, but degradation effects you may take into account. Although these tools do not offer respective models or they have generic models which do not completely help you. So you really need someone to calibrate um, the generic models to your specific technology. And this is something which needs to be done in each and every case for your technology, for your devices, and in thermal uh, or in power device or in power technologies, there are more devices definitely for different power domains. You have a bunch of devices and for all the devices, you need to calibrate the models. This is really a time consuming process and uh, this is something you should really do in order to be safe with your analysis. Another trend that's happening here is we're starting to mix technologies in ways that we didn't. And this is this is definitely happening in advanced packages, because as you open this up to uh, beyond reticle size, suddenly you say, oh, we can add in all these different features. What sort of impact is that having? One important technology development is to, to bring different technologies together. And um, what we see here is, for instance, gallium nitride, on silicon, so uh, for uh, cost reasons, you do not uh, use a gallium nitride wafer, but use the cheaper silicon wafer and put gallium nitride on top of it. But then you have different um, lattice constant in the different um, metals, and therefore you need to carefully design the interface between silicon and gallium nitride, which is then uh, important as, for instance, for, for thermal aspects. They have different thermal constants. And once this heats up, which is typical in, in power devices, then you have may get uh, a bow of the of the wafer, which is that, or you get get degradation effects or, or some, some reliability effects, some cracks in it. You don't want them. So that's why uh, this has to be carefully designed already by the technology guys and, and the device designers. And yeah, one important direction of, of uh, future development. And it's not just stopping there with uh, SICK and GAN, it's also some of the uh, TIMs that are going in there too, right? You have a whole bunch of new materials that are coming into these devices. Sure, uh, other devices are uh, uh, coming up as well. We will see whether they, what, what the solutions in the future are, whether you stack them on top of each other, put them side by side into a system and package, um, then um, you have to talk about uh, standardized interfaces like we have it in the, in the chiplet area. So we, we will see which is the solution that really uh, will set the, the, the future standards and then our other technology will come into play and this will work together into an overall system and package. This is getting very complicated. Rowan Yanka, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Thank you.